Keep your eye on that right there. <laughs> Nativity scenes declare it, and Christmas cards portray it. Choirs sing about it. We've done it here today. So much of Christmas centers on the fact that he came. Everybody say, that he came. The stable, shepherds, wise men, the star in the east, Mary and Joseph. When I was in college, our choir put on a Christmas musical that was written by our choir director, Wayne Goodine. It was way back in the early 1990s. It simply was entitled, And So He Came to Us. The one true God, the Jehovah of the Old Testament, took upon himself the form of a man. And as the Son of Man was born of the Virgin Mary. Paul the Apostle writes it like this, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. He came unto his own in John 1, and his own received him not. This one True God was manifest in the flesh. It's why Paul told the Corinthians in his second letter to them that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And in him, in Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that God is, is in Jesus. Everything that makes God who God is, was in Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus in his humanity was a man, but in his deity was and is God. His flesh was the lamb or the sacrifice of God. He is the only mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Paul said it, there is one God. Everyone shout it, say one God. There is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You see, according to scripture, Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And because of this, Jesus on his father's side was divine, but on his mother's side was human. Thus, he was known as the son of God, but also the son of man or the God man. I wish to direct you to the prophecies from the Old Testament that speak of what will happen because Jesus would come. His name was May, Ray Major Can, and, and he said it like this so well. God overwhelms us with the proof of his existence. He said, your arms are too short to box with God. He will win with his proof every single time. The Old Testament contains over 400 prophecies about a coming Messiah and Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled every single one of them. Do you know what the odds are of that happening? Think about this a single man fulfilling every prediction, 400 plus predictions about a coming Messiah, the Savior of the world. A professor by the name of Peter Stoner work with 600 students to figure out what the probability would be of just eight of over 400 prophecies 
being fulfilled in any one person who had lived up to the present time. What would the probability be of one person fulfilling not 400 plus, just eight of the prophecies? The result was one in 100 with 21 zeros behind it. That's if one person fulfilled just eight of the prophecies in Scripture about a coming Messiah. A great author by the name of Lee Strobel, who was an atheist turned Christian, performed calculations to try to figure out what this would look like in real life. And here's what Strobel notes. He said, imagine the entire world being covered with white tiles about an inch and a half square. Every bit of dry land on our globe covered with one and a half inch square tiles. And then on the bottom of just one of those tiles that covers every square inch of the dry land of this earth, I was to paint it red. Just one of the tiles that covered the earth. Picture a person then being allowed to wander around for a lifetime around all seven continents. He would be permitted to bend down only one time and pick up a piece of tile. What are the odds that it would be the one tile whose reverse side was red? The odds would be the same as just eight of the Old Testament prophecies coming true in any one person throughout history. Those are pretty high odds. J. Barton Payne listed some 574 verses in the Old Testament that had direct personal words written about a coming Messiah. There are very few under the sound of my voice or perhaps around this world that are Christian followers that will dispute that there are at least six direct messianic predictions in just the first five books in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, Eve was promised that a male descendant from her line would crush the head of the serpent or the devil himself and win completely over evil, Satan would be finally vanquished. That's Genesis chapter number 3. We go six chapters later to Genesis chapter 9 and it is prophesied that God would come and he would live and dwell in the tents of Shem or the Semitic people. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2 narrows the focus when God calls Abram from the house of Shem to go from Ur in Mesopotamia to Israel, and he was to be a blessing for all the nations of the earth. The Lord God said to Abram, you're going to be a blessing, and your, your heritage is going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless those that bless you, and I'm going to curse those who curse you. There would come someone from the loins of Abram that would shake the world. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 8, this promise can be narrowed down even further for the tribe of Judah. Jacob is giving his last words on his deathbed to his sons. And he says to son number four, Judah, that he would be the one from whom God would bring a scepter of ruling. And from the line of Judah, the Messiah would come. It was in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 15 that this coming one from Judah would be, as the scripture calls it, a star 
that would come out of Jacob and a scepter that would rise out of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, the fifth reference, direct messianic reference in the first five books of the Bible, that Messiah would come and he would also be a prophet. It is no wonder when John the Baptist pointed a bony finger down the road and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He wasn't talking about an arbitrary man. He wasn't talking about just a casual passerby. He was talking about a Savior, a man that had been prophesied about. There is nobody like Jesus. We open up the first two-thirds of our Bible and we will find that 11 of the Psalms celebrate the person and the work of this coming Messiah. The Psalms tell us that he would be rejected, Psalm 118. He would be betrayed, Psalm 69, and also Psalm 109. He would die, but he would resurrect from the dead, Psalm 22 and Psalm 16. He would come as a conqueror and as an enthroned ruler, according to Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. He would come as a planner and as a groom, Psalm 40 and Psalm 45. And he would come as a triumphant king, as declared in Psalm 68 and Psalm 72. Isaiah prophesied and said the Messiah would be born of a virgin. That was a prophecy. But Matthew chapter 1 and verse 33 tells us that he came as a child born of a virgin. So it's not just an angel spouting off or a prophet declaring about a prophecy. There's actual fulfillment of this man named Jesus. There's actual fulfillment of this child in a manger. Micah prophesied in the fifth chapter of his prophetic book and said his birthplace would be Bethlehem. Matthew chapter 2 identifies it as so. John the Baptist would be his forerunner, Isaiah said in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. Malachi also prophesied in chapter 3 and verse 1. So it stands to reason that in Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 3, the Bible says that John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. It was further announced ahead of time that Messiah would enter Jerusalem in triumph as the crowd shouted, Hosanna. We go in our Bibles to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and talk about that. But that was actually prophesied hundreds of years before. Zechariah chapter 9, Psalm 118 said, There's coming a ruler who Jerusalem will be enraptured in praise, shouting, Hosanna. The psalmist said in less than a week, he would be betrayed. Acts chapter 1 declares it to be so. Messiah's side would be pierced according to Zechariah chapter 12. And in John chapter 19, we see the accounting and the fulfillment of that prophecy. He would suffer vicariously for the sins of the world. Isaiah prophesied that. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 6 and 9 and 12, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 tells us that he took on sin of the entire world. Even more dramatically accurate was the fact that Jesus would be killed with the wicked ones, hung between common criminals. You know who said that? Not just the New Testament. Isaiah prophesied that in Isaiah 53 and verse number 9. He said he's going to be hung with the criminals and he would be buried with the rich one. No wonder Jesus on the road to Emmaus himself teaching about himself. You talk about a strange environment. You're talking to Jesus, and he's asking you about Jesus. He comes alongside two men that are down in the dumps. They're saddened. They're sullen. Their countenance is down. And he says, tell me, brethren, what's been going on? They say, have you not been around? Christ was crucified. He went by the way of the grave. But in Luke chapter 24 and verse 25, he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, 
he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, those of you that are new to our church, you're going to have to pardon me because I'm getting a little wound up this morning. Can you imagine what that must have been like? On the road, downtrodden, sullen, and sad because your ruler, the one that you admired, had been crucified on a Roman cross. And a strange man walks up to you and says, Hey guys, anything new happening? To which you replied, What rock did you crawl out from today? This man named Jesus was crucified on a cross. We're down. He was a healer. He was a redeemer. He was a deliverer. We saw him raise the dead. We saw him open deaf ears. We saw him open blind eyes. And he's no longer with us. To which Jesus said, let me teach you for a moment. There is a coming Messiah. Can you see him walking through the Old Testament scriptures? You remember Isaiah fellas prophesying about a coming Messiah and they're nodding their head. This guy really knows his stuff. This guy's really studious. But can you imagine the moment when all of a sudden it dawns on the guys walking to Emmaus. The one that they're talking to is not just a learned man. Is not just a studious man. Is not just somebody that is in tune with Old Testament scripture. Oh, somebody help me preach right now. But that man that you're walking with is God in flesh. God in flesh. The one that was hanging on the cross is now walking with us. The one that died a Roman death is now alive forevermore. Jesus was breaking bread with them. And the scripture says in the middle of that meal, it hit them. You talk about a woe moment. I would have loved to have had my iPhone recording that moment. Just standing over in the corner with it on landscape, because that's a better video. When something, I don't know if it was his hands breaking the bread with the prints of the nails in his wrists, or it was maybe just an aha moment that hit these guys, and all of a sudden Jesus is there, and then he's gone. And those men have this idea go flying through their head. Hey, he's alive. He's alive. That one that we saw heal people, he's not in that grave anymore. He's alive. He said he was coming up out of that grave, and he came up out of that grave. Jesus is alive. Now, I'm going to tell you exactly what I've been praying for for this service today. I've been praying that every man and woman would have an aha moment in your spirit today. That you would understand whether this is your church or you're just a guest of someone at this church today. That something would go flying through your brain today. That no matter what your life is right now, there is a Savior. And there is a risen God who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. Somebody hear me right now. He's not in a manger. He's not in a stable. And he sure enough isn't in a grave. He is alive and he is well and able to do anything. We talk a whole lot at Christmas time about the fact that he came. But in the closing few moments of this service, I want to focus our attention on what is ours because he came. Because there's a lot of people that acknowledge he came. Can I say it? 
billions today that will flock to candlelight services, Christmas Eve services, Christmas Day services, and they will say most assuredly, Jesus came. But I want to focus our attention today, not that he came. Thank God for that. But what is ours today? Because he came. Because if Jesus is merely historical, then we're missing it a hundred miles. If Jesus is just a nice story and a nativity sitting in front of a church, and that's all that Jesus is, then we've missed it a long way. But because he came, we can be healed in our bodies. Isaiah said that the Messiah would heal the sick, Isaiah 35. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will sing for joy. That was the, prophet of a, that was the prophecy of a man named Isaiah who just spouted it out. And somebody wrote it down for posterity. Not realizing that 740 years later, people would send notice to Jesus from John the Baptist who was sitting in a prison. And John the Baptist would say, are you the Christ? Or should we look for another? And Jesus tells those men to go back to John and tell him the blind receive their sight. The lame are walking. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf are hearing. The dead are raised. And the good news is being preached to the poor. Because he came. We can be healed. So right now, by the authority of the word of God, I speak healing over this congregation right now. By the authority of the blood that that Jesus shed on the cross, I rebuke sickness in the name of Jesus Christ. I take authority over every stronghold of disease and I rebuke it not in my power, but in the authority of that Jesus. By the authority of the word of God, I come in alignment and agreement that says by His stripes we are healed. I say healing come in this house right now. Healing virtue flow in this house right now. Bad cells be overcome by good cells. Let the blood of Jesus cover and vanquish any sickness, any disease, any physical stronghold. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Now whether you feel it or not, I wish you'd give him praise for God's healing power. Somebody help me praise him for his healing power. Woo! Hallelujah! By his stripes, I'm healed. Because of his sacrifice, I'm healed. Because he came, I can be set free. Hallelujah. And every bit of fear that would be attached to that sickness, I come against that fear in the name of Jesus Christ. Let peace roll like a river in this house today. Let somebody sleep better tonight, not fearing the diagnosis. I pray it in Jesus' name. I pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. But there is one thing that all while I have been preaching has been present. There is one prophecy that seems to sometimes be glossed over, maybe missed. Yeah, we talk about it from time to time, and especially at certain times of the year. But there is one prophecy that all while I've been declaring the word of God this morning, has been present with us. It's been right in front of us. 
I've been up here spitting and snotting and getting red in the face. And it's been right here. Because every time you peel back the layers of Christmas, the lights, the carols, the trees, the gifts, the turkey, the ham, the cranberry sauce, the dressing, whether you like it southern or northern, when you peel back all of the layers, there still exists one clear prophecy that was spoken to one of the most primary figures in all of what we call the Christmas story. Joseph, she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. He's going to be a healer. Praise God for that. He's going to be a deliverer. Praise the Lord for that. He's going to be a miracle worker that wows people. Thank God for that. But Joseph, I just want to tell you before the babe ever shows up, what's going to be primary and most important. His name will be called Jesus. And he will save his people from their sins. Healer, yes. Deliverer, yes. Waymaker, yes. Glory, yes. But Savior, Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Brother Gaddy, why is this so important to you? Because I can go to heaven sick. I can go to heaven with my mind bound up. I can make it to heaven when all the relationships aren't fixed. But, honey, I can't get to heaven unless he saves me from where I'm at right now. Oh, new life in Cabot. Because he came, I can be saved. I can be saved. I can be saved. I don't have to go to hell. I don't have to live in my sin. I don't have to be separated from God for eternity. Because he came, he will save his people from their sins. Slap your neighbor a high five and say, because he came. Be seated just for a moment. I'm just about done. Matthew records these words from the angel to Joseph. Mark had a gospel that he wrote about Jesus that was primarily written to the Romans. Luke had a story about Jesus that he wrote that was primarily written to the Greeks. John had a gospel that was written primarily to Christians everywhere. But Matthew's gospel, the one that talks about that one prophecy of him saving his people from their sins, had an audience primarily made of Jews. Jews who at that moment were living under Roman tyranny. Jews who had despair about their identity and their future. And yet to that group of people, the angel says, there's coming a Messiah who will save his people. Salvation is coming. Because he came, you and I, don't have to be in despair any longer. What has lorded over us for a long time doesn't have to envelop us forever. We were created by an eternal God. He breathed into us, Genesis chapter 2 says, the breath of life. And because of that, our spirit, that part of us, will never die. And because of that, we Need saving. 
Now, I will be very direct today. And my risk that I will take is to potentially be misunderstood by those whom you don't go to church here very often. And I promise you that is not my intent. But it seems like the further we go in life and in culture, the less prone that some are to call, can I use a phrase, to call a spade a spade. When it comes down to it, friends, I'm either saved or I'm lost. Now you can act like I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to Tim Gaddy right now. When I stand before Jesus someday, he's not going to ask me how much I went to church. He's not going to ask me, did you tithe? He's not going to ask me, were you involved in ministry? He's going to simply look and see, is my blood covering him? Has he given his life to me? Has he been saved? I'm saved or I'm lost. Now, I know some that would like to take this truth and just beat people up with it. Bless God. You're dying and going to a devil's hell. Now that kind of attitude stinks. But the truth remains. When we enter eternity, whew, we are either saved or we are lost. What Adam and Eve did for us, thank you Adam and Eve in the garden, caused a separation between God and man and set up this whole idea of man now separated from God needing a savior. This is why Jesus came. This is why he came in the He didn't come in the manger just to build nativities. He didn't come in the manger just to give us something to get excited about in December or give us a theme for a service. He came as a baby in a manger, robed himself in flesh for the purpose of giving his life so that that man who had been separated from him eternally could be brought back into union with his creator. This is why, hear me, this is why it matters what I do with that man named Jesus. It matters what I do with the message of that man named Jesus. It matters what I do with his character and who he is and what he asks of me. It's not just a nice option. It is a heaven or hell issue. But because he came, he'll save his people. And here's what the angel finished it with. He will save his people. Who are his people? Humans. That's why God became flesh. Because a human had to die. He will save his people from their sins. Look up the word sin in the Bible. It has a lot of different meanings. Primarily missing the mark. Error. Mistake. Impending judgment. But when you and I, on a Sunday morning, lift up our voice and simply say, Save me, Jesus. We are asking him to come and do what only he can do about the error and about the mistake and about the missteps. Everybody here, would you simply say it with me? Say, Save me, Jesus. Say it again. Say, save me, Jesus. In just a moment, not yet, but in just a moment, I'm going to have you stand. And I'm going to ask something of every person in the house today. And that is simply, would you let me pray with you up near the front of this church? No strings attached, no smoke and mirrors, nothing weird. But if I was to come out and pray with each of you individually, we'd be here long after the pot roast burned. We'd be here a long time. But if you would give me the privilege and the honor of praying with you, just praying over us as a church and over us as guests, that would be my honor to do that. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask us to stand and come forward.
I contacted our office staff today before I walked in here, and I said, can you give me a record of everyone that's been water baptized in the name of Jesus here at New Life this year, 2019? And our staff came back and said, Pastor, 32 people have been water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Watch this. Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, according to the book of Acts, for the remission of sins. That sounds oddly like Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, where the, the angel said to Joseph, he shall save his people from their which tells me that something about water baptism has salvation power attached to it. Because if being water baptized like 32 people have been this year in the name of Jesus Christ is for the remission or the removal of sins, there's some saving power in that action right there. Let me ask you a question. How would you like to walk out of here without sin? And before you answer and say, I don't know what that would feel like, let me, let me ask the con converse of that. What's it feel like to walk in with sin? Doesn't that wear you out? It wears me out. I know what it's like to walk into this church after I've done something wrong and I haven't made it right with the Lord. I don't feel quite as free <laughs> to lift up my hands. i got to make it right with Jesus. So if you're here... And you'd like to finish 2019 with sins removed. We can baptize you today. Amen. Baptize you. Now, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to stand in just a moment. We're going to pray honestly. And I'm going to invite you to come and join me. This is not an appeal right now for members of this church. This is an appeal for every breathing person in this church. It's the only way that really I'm not talking to you is if somehow you're not breathing right now. I'll let your neighbor decide if that's happening right now or not. So it's simply a request. I'm not going to come back and drag you. I'm just going to appeal and ask if we can pray together. So would you stand with me, please? If you'd let me pray with you, would you come and just fill up the front of this church? Just come quickly from all over the sanctuary. Come quickly, that's good. Come on. I feel like I'm doing show and tell right now. Y'all can come up. Come on. Come on. I'm not going to bite, I promise. Come on. That means, come on, Sister Deborah. Up, come on, come on. Good, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Come on, come on. That way everybody can get in close. You know how sometimes it's easy to look and say, man, I need all this, Pastor. There's some stuff in my life I need figured out. And it's almost as though we feel like it's about as impossible as turning over that tile and finding a red one. If we turn it over, oh, not it. Oh, not it. Oh, not. And we come many times to Jesus that way as if he's trying to hold something back from us. He's trying to play the old dangle the carrot game. And when you get close, no, oh, just kidding. But there's a Savior here today that's saying you found it. You found him. His name is Jesus. You found the time. It's right now. You found the opportunity. It's right now. You found the direction. It's here right now. So listen, why wait any longer? Pray right now. God, save me. Save me from my despair that I've been feeling. Save me from the depression I've been dealing with. 
Save me from the troubling thoughts that have been in my mind at nighttime. Save me, God, from sin. Save me from the arrogance. Save me from the missteps. Save me from the pride. Save me from the lust. Save me from the, the, the misdeeds that I've committed. Save me from the jealousy and the anger and the bitterness and the unforgiveness. Jesus, save me. And the promise is sure. He will save his people from their sins. So here's, let's, let's do this. Let's just pray right now. Just close your eyes with me. Jesus, I thank you for your great, great sacrifice. I thank you that you came. Lord, when we leave this church today, we're going to drive by Christmas decorations and nativity scenes, and we're going to go home, and there's going to be gifts under the tree, and nativity set up on the mantle, and lights, and songs, and a lot of great things going to happen this week. But God, every one of those things is a testimony that you came. But today, in these precious few moments in this church, I pray that you will help us to take advantage of the things that are available to us because you came. Thank you for the healings that have taken place today, but I'm asking you right now to save, Lord. I'm asking you to save. If you're here and you just want to pray that out to the Lord, you want to slip your hand up and say, God, save me. I repent. Come on, you can pray what I pray or you can pray in your own way. I repent, Lord, of things I've said. I repent of ideas that I have held. I repent of self-reliance. I, I repent of pride, Lord. I repent of pushing you off again. But today is a new day. And because you came, you're going to save your people from their sins. So, Lord, I acknowledge those sins right now. I acknowledge that I can't do it on my own. If left to my own devices, I will always fall back to my flesh, Lord. I confess that to you about me. I ask you to forgive me right now, Lord. I ask you to forgive me of every sin, every willful sin, every sin that I've committed. I didn't even know it was a sin, but I, I went against your word. Forgive me, Lord. And I thank you that your word says if we confess it, you will forgive it, Lord, and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Come on, pray that prayer. Forgive me, Jesus. I'm reaching my spirit up to you, that eternal part of who I am, that part of me that will never die. I'm reaching up to you right now, Lord, and I'm asking you to save, Lord. I'm asking you to save right now, Lord. We are your people, Lord. Save us in this moment right now. Save us from despair, Lord. Save us from hopelessness, Lord. Save us. Let somebody find the power of having those sins, those errors, those mistakes washed away by the blood of Jesus as their water baptized. I pray it in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that you hear us. I thank you, Lord, that you hear us today. Hallelujah. Thank you for hearing us, Lord. Thank you for hearing us, God. Thank you for instilling hope in us at Christmas time, Lord. Thank you for everything that's available to us because you came. Because you came, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here right now, you heard me talk about those that have been baptized and you have never been baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to start singing here in just a minute. If God has touched your heart about that right there, and I believe he has in some people in this room right now, there are people around you who can say, hey, you know what? I'm feeling that nudge. I want those sins washed away. Just wave at them, tap them on the shoulder, tell them we can baptize you before you leave the house today. You can walk out of here before Christmas with sins washed away. Sins washed away. What a powerful thing that is. Amen? Amen. So let's sing, sister.